Don't call me a Grinch, but I'm so grateful that we didn't have a snowstorm this morning. So, and I'm glad you all, I'm glad you all made it out. Um, so, uh, just if, if and when we have a snowstorm, if you uh, see we're having, like, you come up with your snow, some of you, if you like to do that, come up with your snow shovel and your boots and help us get everything all ready. That'd be great. And one other thing, too, there's um, a discipleship a thing that's being held at Horizon. It's part of a, a greater initiative with Foursquare Canada. Um, and Daniel Brown uh, has done, doing a thing about how it's kind of discipleship made easy, whatever that looks like. And um, anyways, on next Saturday from 1 to 4, I'm going to go and I've invited some of our younger people. But maybe you're saying, hey, you know, I'd like to be part of that. So let me know because I need to let them know. It's from 1 to 4 at Horizon. And, and it's about the fact that anyone can be involved in discipling people. So if that's something that tweaks your interest, uh, you can tag up with me so I can tell them how much, uh, how many people are coming. And it's cost free. So and, and for men, women. Uh, neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, we're all one in Christ. So anyways, I just throw that out there. Well, this morning, uh, in my time together, I want to talk to you about being church. And, um, you know, I don't want to ever have cutesy titles. Uh, I just, like, don't like cutesy titles and, you know, doing the doing church and being church, whatever. But I want you to know something that uh, the whole idea about being is a very important concept for me that so often we degenerate to doing. We do life, but we don't enjoy life. We, we, we are about doing. We are not human doings. We are human beings. And the whole idea about being, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a participle, which means it constantly keeps going on. And so it's not a one-time thing, just like this morning when we said that God has laid on my heart 20, 20 one of the things that he is asking of us is to be a people of praise. And a people who are willing to say, we're going to let God move. Because when God authentically moves, nobody um, is going to have a hard time. I don't have a problem with things going long as long as they go long for the right reasons. Not because I'm long-winded, but because Jesus shows up. (laughs) And everybody said amen to that. (laughs) So I want to talk about uh, today. There was a book that greatly impacted my life in 1979, 1980. And... uh, uh, it was a little book called Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness by Jerry Cook. You know, if you've been around, you, you'll you remember he was here with us, and he was in our with us many times. And I can't think of one person who more shaped my view of, of spiritual things, and certainly the church, than Jerry. And, you know, he spoke at our men's retreats, and we called him Uncle Jerry. And, you know, when he'd get up, and, you know, at the, all of the men, we'd say, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. And he'd laugh and whatever. And, and uh, so this book really changed my life. And in this book, he, he began to say, we need to think in terms of church differently. And so, again, um, if you've been around me for any length of time, um, I don't say, well, I'll meet you up at the church. If you hear my vocabulary, I say, meet me at the church building because this is not the church. And once upon a time on the sign, we used to say Sunshine Hills Church meets here and we reduced it down to just Sunshine Hills Church because it was too big and wordy. But that's important to me that when we talk in terms of church, that the church is not a, it's not a place, it's not an activity, it's not an event, but the church first and foremost and always is people, and you are the church. And I appreciated the exhortation this morning, and that kind of we had a wonderful um, uh, opening prayer time on Wednesday, and I feel like we're supposed to be doing more of that, not less, because we're not going to be able to do what God wants us to do if we depend upon human endeavor. So what is the church? The church is always people. And I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. This is the most exciting summary statement of what the church is supposed to do in its purpose. In Ephesians 3.10, if you have your Bibles handy there, uh, uh, you can mark it up. And uh, I, I learned uh, that you can mark up your Bibles electronically now, which is wonderful. Or maybe you've always been able to do it. I'm just behind the curve. But in, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, it's interesting that, that Paul's talking about the mystery of, being revealed. And, and again, I'm not a, a great mystery uh, person or mystery lover, um, you know, and Lottie really likes mysteries and some of you read mysteries. But what happens is a mystery is something that's not understood, but what happens is Jesus came to reveal the mystery. 
And so I want you to know that I'm just declaring in this 2020 Kairos time in season in our church, uh, it's time for us to not just know. It's time for us to not just do. It's time for us to be the church. So here's what it says. It says, his intent was that now, I love that word, and if you want to mark that now, not yesterday, not tomorrow, you know, not five years from now, but it says, but that now through the church. So who is the active agent of what the now is going to happen? It's the church. It says, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Now, I, uh, again, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I took a year of Greek, and, you know, I have the, the, the opportunity of having, co- you know, computer-aided things. And, and it's interesting, this word manifold, it, it, the word it is, it's like probably best translated as technicolor, variegated. And, you know, I'm old enough, I remember TV when, when, when a big TV was 20 inches, and now my computer monitor is bigger than that. You know, and I thought, oh, man, they got a 20-inch TV screen, and, and everything was in black and white, and they would actually, they would actually say, you know, this, to a certain show, it says, presented in color. I remember seeing color TV, and, and watching football was revolutionized, because you could actually see the ball. So it's the manifold wisdom, the technicolor. And so again, I remember when computers first came and they were talking about, you know, so many colors and now it's up to like some sort of bazillion amount of colors that your computer can show. And I want you to know something that, that I, I'm concerned that we have limited ourselves to 16 colors. And I'm concerned that the church has limited itself to a 16 color uh, display of the wisdom of God and it is the time for us to believe for however many bazillions of colors that are now available to us. Let us be the church that is presenting the manifold wisdom of God. And it says that we should make it known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Um, I, I uh, have a devotional reading in the morning that goes along with my Bible reading. And I'm rereading a book called Born After Midnight by A.W. Tozer. And uh, the little essay this morning was on, on Satan. And so there's this balance where we have to respect his power, but we do not want to aggrandize him to the point that that's all we think about and that somehow instead of us being in charge through the, brother and through the word and the blood of Jesus in his name, we just are so afraid that we're going to get beat up. So here's the deal, is that we are not flippant about the power of the evil one, but neither are we paralyzed by fear. But as I said this morning, and and, and, uh, I'm I'm taking note of some of the things that the Lord has been speaking to me this year already, and one of those is, Tom, he's been saying to me, Tom, and I'm now sharing this with you, do not combat spiritual things with physical weapons. Because you will lose every time. And what happens is we tend to to over, over, over overlook when the enemy is at work, and sometimes we over-aggrandize things, like I can get into a whole lot of trouble all on my own without the devil even showing up. But I'm saying we need to be on our guard because spiritual things have to be dealt with with spiritual means. And that through the Lord, through his wisdom, and through the church, that we are to put on notice these rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms and saying we will not allow you to take advantage or to rob or to steal or to destroy. And we need to be standing for marriages. And let me just say that marriages are up in our church and they've been up for a while. And what I mean by that is that Satan knows the power of when a husband and wife are in unity and he will move hell to make that a reality in your life if you're married and pitch you against the one that you have pledged yourself to. So be on the alert. We need to stand when, when young people are going off the rails. We need to realize that that is not just a physical thing, but there is a spiritual dimension. And this scripture tells us that we can make a difference. So 
And going through all of that, that's kind of the scripture. And then I want to talk about, there's two models, and I'm talking about the first model, and Pastor Danny is going to talk about the other. But the two models of the church that Jerry talked about last, when I was reading this book, one is the church as a field, and one is the church as a force. And you say, well, what does that, what does that mean? Well, I want to talk about it. So what, what is the church as a field? How do we explain it? I want to go through this. Pastor Danny is going to talk about the church as a force. Um, and and uh, I'm going to be a little bit out of sequence with my, my notes here. But what's interesting is that, that I used to say it's, the church is only a force, it's not a field. And I have now come to the realization that it's both. So what happens is, is the church as a field explained is in this model, we try to get everybody into this physical place. So when I was growing up, Every uh, announcement on the Sunday morning, it would said, tonight is the evangelistic service. If you grew up in church, you'll remember that. It's the evangelistic service, and bring your friends. And I was passing, Lottie and I, we pastored this small church in, in Sydney. There was 30 of them counting us, and uh, they had been Christians a long time. And when I would say, well, bring your unsaved friends, I used to say that word. I says, you know, uh, unsaved friends. And, and they would look at each other and says, well, we, but you, these, are our, these are our friends. And who are we going to invite? So that's, again, part of this thing. We have to fire on many cylinders. So we're firing on, uh, like, you know, we've, we're seeing a, a, a surge in the prophetic, you know, last year and the year before, we sat down in the room back there and said, what, how are we going to encourage the prophetic voice? And we're seeing that, and we want to say more. Bring it on, Lord Jesus. Amen? Bring it on, Lord Jesus. And we talk about praise. Bring it on, Lord Jesus. So this is a season where we are no longer in a situation where people are looking to, a, to come to a church, but they are only going to come to a church mostly because one of us touches them. And there is something where you can bring them into a place like this as the field and be able to feel the presence of Jesus in a way that is more difficult with just one or two people. So this, the church is a field um, that, is, as it's explained, let's look at it in more detail. So the problem is, is that if we're not careful, if it's not, it's not either or, but it's both in. But what happens is the emphasis is on getting non-church or non-Christian people inside the four walls of the building where they can receive Christ. Now, that should be an outgrowth as the church becomes alive. When people are looking, I've always said that if God's going to send people to a church, he's going to send people that are seeking. He's going to send them to a church that's going to be very clear about what they stand for and about what they believe. And now, again, language is slippery. But, um, you know, I had this friend, his name was Henry, and he came from a Roman Catholic background, and this was in the 80s, and he was my racquetball partner for many years. And, um, you know, I was talking to him and said, well, how did you come to faith? And so somebody invited him to one of our churches, one of the four square churches. And um, this was before society was as wide open with people raising their hands when they scored a goal and whatever and loud and boisterous and whatever it was. And so he came into church and, you know, he was Roman Catholic. And so when you come into church, you know, you, 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 you kneel and you, you, you do the sign of the cross and all of that. And all of a sudden he's in and people are laughing and they're, you know, enjoying being in each other's presence and they're raising their hands and they're praising the Lord out loud. And he said, what kind of a kook bin did I walk into? And um, so it's interesting that um, he, he, he went away and he and his wife were saying, boy, that was just the wackiest thing I've ever seen. And it wasn't like out of, out of control, but it was just something and he had an experience. And so they, you know, he said, I don't know if we can go back. But then the more they thought of it, there was something compelling about being in a, with a group of people who were united in love, who were praising and who were lifting up the name of Jesus. And so what happens then is when we embrace the fact that sometimes the church needs to be the, for, the field. So can I encourage you to know this is me just inching us forward. If you're an athlete, you know that before you participate, you limber up, you, you stretch, and you do all of those things, you prepare. And what happens is if you, as an athlete, if you don't prepare before the game, the chances of injury is very great or at least you're getting limbered up and, you know, the, the game is half over before you're in the game and you're loosened up. 
So I want to challenge all of us, and I'm including myself in this. So if we want to embrace this model, one of the models, and I think it's not either or, but both in. So I want to challenge you to be preparing yourself before you arrive at this place. So let me tell you a couple of things. My, my mother-in-law, Lottie's mom, um, I, I, I loved her. She was full of just this folk wisdom, and she said that Sunday morning begins on Saturday night. And so what happens is like when you, when you get up, what if you set your alarm 15 minutes earlier and you say, I'm going to be part of the church gathered this morning or this evening, and I'm going to, before I even get there, I'm going to already start to turn my thoughts to the Lord. And, and, and you know what happens is, is that if we really say, hey, it's game day. It's, 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 it's game time. So when we get here, and, and you know, I don't want to be harping at you all. And, you know, like I thought about a couple of weeks ago when I talked about we need to be careful about not taking the name of the Lord in vain. I didn't zero in on anybody on that. But I'm just saying I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says. But can I encourage you, and, and, you know, it's not about making it easy, but can I just encourage us to really make a conscious effort that, that the game starts at 9 and to be here so that, you know, so that when we're, we're all starting together, because, you know, the worship leaders, they, they, they put a whole series of songs together that they've heard from God, or, and that you're praying on your way here. Maybe turn off the radio, or maybe if you and your wife are in the car, and you, you know, maybe say, hey, Lord, we're going to church today. Can we just show up? Are you, do, you hear my, do you hear my heart in that? Just to, if, if we really start to see, so when people come, that, and, you know, the other thing is, is we, we tend to become very, immune to what God does when we gather. Can I tell you what I hear from people all of the time about our church? I hear when, when new people come in, especially people who are not yet Christians, they come in when, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we had the baptism, it was on the, the 29th, so, so a person who came because one of the boys was being water baptized, he came up to me and says, yeah, I don't go to church, but I really like the vibe of this place. And I, and I said, well, you know, thank you. And I said, I'd like you to know that that's really what we want. We want for people, when they come into this place, to feel welcome and to feel the presence of Jesus. The big M, mo, you know, momentum. But the problem is, the, the downside of, of, of that is, is that then ministry only happens in the four walls of this church. And that... We'll, we'll add to a tremendous barrenness of the church. If the only time people ever hear about the gospel is when they are brought into a church building, that is far less than what God is asking of us. We are called to be church. In your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your extended family. And so again, you know, I've gotten criticized that, you know, I grew up in a church that we had an altar call every Sunday. And if somebody wanted to come and give their heart to Jesus... You know, they had, it didn't count if they didn't come forward. And it didn't count if they weren't crying. And I'm not making fun of that. These are, these, this, these are wonderful times I grew up in. But what happens is, is that people will say, well, Pastor Tom, why don't you, you know, make them come forward? Like we ask people to raise their hands. And, and you know, and I told you in the 37 years Lottie and I have been able to be here, and I, I, I don't have all the records when <coughs> Mel and Vi were here and others, but... From 1982 to now, we've had over 1,400 people make a decision for Jesus as a result of this church. And, 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 and that's, a, that's a pretty significant figure, but you know what? I get really nervous when a month goes by and I'm not hearing that somebody has made a decision as a result of the ministry of this church. Just like I get nervous when the, when the nursery doesn't have babies in it. Because what happens is, is that if we don't have babies back there and we got a wonderful space and whatever, but we don't have babies back there, that means we are not reaching a young demographic that is investigating how to live their lives and make a difference. I'm encouraging you. This is encouragement today. But it's inward looking and, and everything happens here and it's program driven. And now the reality is, is that it's important to have a plan. You know, I can point to you through scriptures that Jesus had a plan. 
but and people had plans, but there were times where the plan, Jesus, like sometimes I've had a plan and, and then something totally different happens. They said, well, Lord, what was that all about? And he says, well, that was just because I know you get nervous if you don't have a plan. But, this, but I want you to go with, now this is, this, is, this is plan A. Does that make sense? You know, now as we're working with you. So, and then the professionals do all the work. And so can I just tell you something? And, and I'm reevaluating, and I'm saying, okay, God, in this year of 2020, your Kairos moment, Lord, I don't want to put you in a box. I don't want to limit you in any way. So I believe in pastors. There are people that God, we, we recognize that, you know, like me, that have been recognized that we have a gifting and a calling to give a certain leadership. But if it's all about just one person or just a few people, and I believe we have elders because it, it, it means when people come in that these are people who have been recognized and have been vetted. And so when we sometimes call for the elders, it's not about putting them on a pedestal. It's just to facilitate things. But the reality is I'm telling you that the church is a force. One of the places where it falls apart is as if all of the ministry has to be done by the professionals. And that is not my heart. And so I want you to know... You are called as a minister of Jesus Christ. Wherever you are, whatever you do. And what happens is, is that, so Jerry really helped to break the stranglehold of the clergy where the clergy was here and the laity were down here. And the reality is, is that the church is a force, Danny's going to talk about that, is releasing everyone to do what God is wanting them to do. So here's where we are. So when we gather... I want to create something. I want you to think about this. So when we gather, we, not me, we want to create a warm and welcoming and inviting space. Have you ever been over to somebody's house and you just didn't feel welcome? I have. Or they were doing it out of obligation. And so can I tell you, this is another thing, and I'm just declaring this is a new season. But, you know, it breaks my heart if I see somebody new comes in and no one reaches out to them. And, and you know, I want you to know I, I really beat myself up, you know, last week. And I don't ever say, well, I did this and I did this. And when I say that, it's not about me doing this, but it's really kind of like if I can do it, if I'm, this, if I'm a goofball and I can do some of these things, then you can too. So can I encourage us that I, 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 I believe that part of the DNA of, of Sunshine Hills has always been that we care about people. We care about individuals, getting to know people by name. And, and you know, and, 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 and again, when we have new people coming, and the thing is we have people who come, are coming from different parts of the world, and, and they don't know anybody. And our world is a very closed place. And, and so what happens, one of the places that they can start to feel that this wonderful Canada is a warm and lovely place is because Canadians, like you and me, we reach out. And sometimes we get bogged down and, you know, we, we don't, we, I'm too busy to invite people to our house and all that stuff. And, and I just want you to know that we need to do work on this. We need to do work on this. And one of our people who's not here this morning, she's got a plan, and she said, Pastor Tom, we need, to, we need to be better. We need to restart this whole thing about and having people over. And, and one of the things that we've talked about, too, is one of the things that I've been encouraged about is, is this last year we have regained our soul. That I've noticed that we're standing around and we're talking and we're, pr we're praying with each other and it's organic. And there for about a year and a half, I, and part of it was because I was in such a bad spot, I'm sure. But people would just zoom out the building. And now people are sharing. And, and I just want you to know that's part of the church's field. If you're going to invite people into your home, then we need to make sure that, that they feel loved and warmed and welcomed. And, and you know them by name, and you look for opportunities. And, and so, guys, I am, I am personally inviting you to come to Todd's house for our men's thing. We're going to just hang out. And even if you don't like hockey, or you know, there'll be cars and dominoes, and just hanging out as guys. And, and you know, that men's ministry, we're creating a space where, where we can invite people that, are, that don't, you don't, they don't even have to be a Christian. 
And that would be a good thing. Just say, come hang out with us. And they say, wow, we create and, and we create a relevant and authentic spiritual climate where the Holy Spirit is free to work. And I'm being really real today that I have, there's this tension that I feel at times that, you know, I, I'm wanting to make sure that we, we keep moving forward. You know, I don't want to lag behind. I don't want to run too far ahead. I need people to encourage me. <laughs> and say, come on, you know, we need to push a little bit. And I like that. And I'm pushing a little bit this morning. And I'm hoping that as I push a little bit, we can push a lot. Because I believe that you're, we're ready as a church to use an old Ohio expression, pin our ears back and go for it. it. You know, and it doesn't mean it's weird or goofy or anything like that, but where that we create a space that is relevant and the authentic spiritual climate where the Holy Spirit is free to work, I believe that a true seeker will not ever be turned off where they sense the presence of Jesus. Now, will some people be turned off? Because that was part of a conversation I had with one of my friends. That the that gospel can be offensive. I get that. But when people are seeking, we want to make sure that we show them what they're seeking. Hello? I close with this. You've heard this story before, but I want to close with a story from Uncle Jerry. It's not either or, but both and. So Uncle Jerry, uh, this is when he was working this whole thing out, and somebody phoned him and said, Pastor Jerry, you got to come over to my house. My friend, I'm talking to her about Jesus, and she's ready to receive Jesus, and you got to come over and pray with her so that she can receive Jesus. And so Jerry was, oh, this is great. Got in his Volkswagen. And I knew it was okay because I had one of those two. We had one of those two. So Jerry was driving, and the Holy Spirit just, while he's driving, says, what are you doing? And Jerry says, well, I'm going. So-and-so has asked me over to pray for somebody. He says, well, why are you going? She's there. And you need to turn your car around. This is before cell phones. And you need to call her and tell her that she can do that. So he turned the car around. He went back and he called and he says, Pastor, where are you? You're supposed to be here. You know, I got him on the hook. <laughs> and uh, so Jerry says, no, the Lord said, you, you've taken it this far. Did you receive Jesus? Yes. Did somebody pray with you? Yes. This is the whole discipleship evangelism thing. Well, then just do what you what somebody did for you. And so anyway, so she, she, she said, okay. And so then the phone was half an hour and 45 minutes. And Jerry's like, oh, man, he's freaking out. What's going on? Is she okay? And she calls, and she's bawling on the phone. Oh, Pastor Jerry. And I won't. So I'll, but she's like, oh, it was so wonderful that my friend gave her heart to Jesus. And then I talked to her about, you know, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she was wonderfully filled. And we're just having a wonderful time over here. And the Lord spoke to Jerry and said, had you gone, that person would have given their heart to Jesus, but you would have robbed that person from being the church. So you get ready for me to be repetitious. So we need to be the, the, the churches of, as a field. And so let me tell you, and then I'm done. Next Sunday, I am praying when Cam gets water baptized. And here's how I'm praying. In September, this room was filled with over 140 people from the community and us. And they saw a little boy who was days, if not weeks, from dying. And they're going to see that same little boy. Still, God has to intervene, the, the, you know, the reality, but every day is a gift. But they're going to see the little boy who's going to be able to get down on his own into the water baptism tank and you're going to be following Jesus and I'm praying for nurses. I'm praying for some of the Canucks to show up if they're in town. I'm serious. I'm, I'm asking big, right? I'm praying for people and I want you to know and one of my favorite things from 2020 was that night, 2019, thank you, where Cam was right about right where Lottie's sitting and all there was like 32 little kids and they were laying hands on him, and they were believing, and we have seen a miracle. It's time. So when people show up in this spot, in this place, when we gather, let's make sure we show them what they're looking for. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for our time together this morning. And God, this is, we've had a time in, and again, Lord, just that 
we really want to say yes to you. Yes, I will. So, Lord, I pray that, that we won't just talk about this, this but there are people here who, who don't see anybody in the course of the week. They come and they smile and they go home alone. There are people who need to be encouraged. There's people who need to be included. There's people who need to know that somebody cares whether they live or die. There are people that are in our community that are looking for community and connection. I pray, Lord, that you would just release us and, Lord, give us a plan like you did for Joshua to take Jericho. Lord, we need to bring the walls of isolation down. We need to build, we need to tear the walls down of of people who are alone and who, who feel uh, uh, that no one cares. We need to, to truly be what we say. We are a community of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. I pray this in Jesus' name. And would you keep your eyes closed? Again, maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you've been here lots of times. Maybe this is your first time. But you've never made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Right where you are. Nobody's looking around. And I have asked our elders just so I don't miss anybody. But by raising your hand, you're saying, Pastor Tom, would you pray for me? I'm making a decision to follow Jesus this morning. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. So, Lord, we thank you. We're going to be the church. And we are in the process of being the church. And we want to reflect your, gla- your grace and glory. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Would you stand? So, being church doesn't stop now. If you want prayer, there are people in this room that love to pray. They'll probably they'll be here at the front. If you, you know the porch is downstairs where there's you know, there, there's coffee, but just let's be th- let's let's commit to being the church. God bless you. Let's be all that we're supposed to be. Amen. Oh, you are.